thank you, Hotek. Um, so this is some uh, work that you know we have been doing, uh, you know, very recently, and uh, the paper is up on archive. And this is joint work with my students, uh, Yixian Wang and Shuang Song. Okay. So you know we have all heard about uh, you know differential privacy. Uh, this work is about a slightly different setting, and you know to me what this is about is how to use the insights that we get from differential privacy to look at you know uh, privacy in slightly different settings. Okay? So in differential privacy, what happens is you are dealing with sensitive data of the nature of you know so things like medical records or genetic data of people and search logs, uh, and you know if you look at uh, if you uh, saw Adam's tutorial this morning, uh, this is kind of the standard differential privacy setting, right? So I'm, you know, there are obviously many variants of this setting possible, but I'm, I am picking, you know, like a basic standard setting, right? I mean, you can also do this interactively and things like that. But the basic standard setting looks like this: you have a bunch of people's data, right? So XI ref refers to the data of individual I. Uh, these all get fed into some privacy mechanism. And then you know this mechanism uh, calculates some private function. So you know this could be, uh, for example, uh, you know something as simple as you know counts of some predicates. Or if you are a machine learning person like I am, this would be like uh, you know could be a classifier based on the data, or this could be some result of some hypothesis test based on the data, right? So. So something that comes out and this result is pub public, right? And what you are looking to do is you are looking to make sure that the participation of any individual XI in this data set does not affect the probability of any outcome, right? So this was differential privacy, okay? So in my talk, we are going to look at a slightly different setting. And, you know, again, as I said, uh, what uh, we are going to do is we are going to look at how the insights that we gain from differential privacy, because, you know, to me, differential privacy really teaches me how to think about privacy, right? So how, how do we look at these insights that we gain from differential privacy to look at, you know, slightly different scenarios, right? So an example of, you know, what do I mean by correlated data? An example would be things like user information in social networks. So you have a bunch of people connected together in social networks and, you know, their information is quite correlated because, you know, you're normally your friends with similar people. I'm not saying that it's always exactly the same, but, you know, there's some correlation, okay? Uh, another application that actually really motivated this work is uh, physical activity monitoring. Uh, now, what happens is, let's say you have an app which records what you are doing, uh, and let's say look at a very simple version of the problem where it's, uh, you know, it records whether you are, let's say, walking or running or sitting or sleeping or something like that. And what you would like to do is you would like to uh, share some of these aggregate results over some period of time, you know, maybe with your doctor, maybe with your friends, maybe, you know, your provider and things like that. And uh, uh, you want some form of privacy, right? So you don't want them to know what you were doing at a specific instant, but if they know things like, you know, on an average you run one mile a day, that's okay, right? So these kinds of settings, okay? Uh, and this is again very correlated because what I'm doing right now is highly correlated with what I'm doing a couple of minutes later, okay? So this is again correlated data, okay? So, you know, again, this is the example that I was talking about. One example is this physical activity. You know, this is time series data, so this would be a correlation model. You have what you're doing at time t is related to time t plus one, and so the most common model for this is a Markov model. So this would be like a, you know, this kind of a Markov model. And here, what you are trying to do is hide what the specific activity is at each period of time, but what you have to worry about is that there are there is correlation across time. Okay. Uh, here is another example. Uh, let's say you have some network of, uh, you know, let's say in a very simple case, you have a network of people who work together, right, or children who go to school together and things like that. And there, uh, what you have is, uh, you know, basically what you are trying to see is how flu spreads through such a network, let's say, right. And, you know, if you have small children, you would know that once a child in a daycare gets flu, a lot of uh, children in that same daycare is going to get flu, right. So these things are very correlated. And, uh, you know, what you, you know, so what you might care about is, uh, you might care about that uh, uh, you want to publish some aggregate statistics, but what you might care about is that, uh, uh, the adversary who has some prior knowledge may not want to be able to, uh, may not be able to infer anything about a specific child. So that would be one of the things you might care about here. Okay? Uh, 
Okay. So again, in these cases, it turns out that you know privacy is hard, and partly, and and one of the reasons for this is that you know is this correlation, right? So the neighborhood, so there is so much correlation among the neighbors, and that leaks information on a single user, or there is correlation among the time entries, so you know which leaks information on uh, neighboring time entries. It's like a different problem. I mean, one used to work on the individual, the others, it's really a feature. I mean, I know yes, that's know. correct. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah. One is the feature and one is the individual. Yes, you're okay. correct. Uh, and what we are going to talk about is how do we calculate statistics from sensitive, you know, these kinds of sensitive correlated data while still preserving privacy. Okay. Uh, and we'll talk about, you know, first how to define privacy and privacy mechanisms for correlated data. Okay, let's start with how to define privacy for uncorrelated data. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm guessing you guys were all here this morning, so you know this, but let me remind you because I want to point out one specific thing about the differential privacy definition. And that specific thing will be a little bit different when I look at correlated data. Okay, so I, bear with me for a second I'll, uh, while I remind you. Okay, so again, we looked at differential privacy this morning. Uh, the idea is that the participation of a single person does not change the output, right? So if you have a randomized algorithm, if you change one person's value in the data, the distribution of the output would be quite similar. Okay? And more formally, this is what it looks like. If you have D1 and data sets D1 and D2 that differ in a single individual's value, any set of outcomes S, if A is an alpha differentially private randomized algorithm, then probability that A of D1 lies in the set is at most e to the epsilon times the probability that A of D2 lies in a set, right? And this holds for every set, right? And here, the thing I want to point out is that these probabilities are over the randomness of the algorithm, okay? So keep this in mind, this is just over the randomness of the algorithm, not the sampling of the data, right? So keep this in mind, we will come back to this in a little bit. Okay, so this is the differential privacy definition. Okay, now let's look at how uh, what happens with correlated data. Okay, so um, here um, you know is the the physical activity measurement example that I had talked about a little while ago. Uh, here, what you have is your data set is x1 to xt, where x uh, x little t is the activity at time t, right? So it's a discrete value which uh, you know, could be running, walking, so on, right? And what we are looking to do is we are looking to publish the activity histogram. So we are looking to publish a histogram of activities. And we want to prevent an adversary who might have some prior knowledge from knowing what the activity was what at a certain time t. Okay? And so, you know, uh, if you look at differential privacy, so again, remember that this is a single person's data, but there is a, wa a variant of differential privacy which will deal with the situation without correlations. That's, I think, in the literature that has been called entry differential privacy, right? And I, when I say entry uh, differential privacy, I think this was in one of the uh, Roth, Hart and Roth papers. They called it entry privacy. And uh, there the idea is basically, you know, you imagine each, uh, you take out uh, the, Basically, the idea is that uh, the participation of every single entry shouldn't make a difference. So this was entry privacy. And if you look at entry privacy, what you can do is you can output the histogram of activities, and then you add noise with, you know, let's say standard deviation approximately one, right? So if you are looking at epsilon, then it would be about one over epsilon, but let's just say one, okay? And uh, so this is fine, but what would happen is if your activities across time are highly correlated, uh, you, this would not be enough noise, right? And in fact, there is a very uh, nice and elegant variant of differential privacy called uh, couple worlds privacy, which is uh, work by Vasily et al. and you know, Adam, um, obviously. And uh, so we, we worked out what they would do, but they would also you know, do essentially the same thing. Okay? Um, that, that, that's, uh, that would not be enough, okay? Another uh, version of differential privacy is uh, group differential privacy, where you are trying to figure out, uh, you know, protect the privacy of a whole group, right? And you know, you can also think about an entry variant of it, so you can call it group entry differential privacy. Here, uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to protect the uh, values of an entire correlation, uh, entire group of correlated entries, right? But here, everything is correlated, right? So, you know, there, there is a lot of correlation between adjacent time entries. If you look at time entries that are far apart, the correlation is much less. 
but really everything is correlated, right? So you can't say that, okay, this group is correlated, but that group is not. And what ends up happening is you end up adding noise with standard deviation t, right? Which is the total length of the chain, and the results are not very really useful. Okay, so this is uh, what would happen. Yes. So this is this is not useful because the the, the deviation here is, is big, right? So exactly. The noise is too much. Exactly. Exactly. So you have you know. Uh, in kind of a, I guess, sort of an uh, information theory view, the signal is about uh, T and the noise is also about T, right? So it's not. Uh, yes? Can I correlate data can be mapped to a, a kernel space where it's orthogonal and then you can. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. But these, yes. are, these activities are discrete. So yeah, these are discrete. But anyway, we, we can take yeah, that up. Uh, yeah. Yes, okay. But you don't have to have enough data to then uh, make sure that this is. So you just, just have one sample path, right? Yeah, we just have a single sample path. Yeah. You have a single path. Under certain assumptions. So we can take that offline. Let's go ahead. Uh, the other one is the flu example that we talked about. You want to publish the number of people with flu, and you want to prevent the adversary from inferring whether a particular child has flu or not, right? And here again, if you can use, uh, if you use differential privacy, uh, the view that you would take is the participation of a single child would not make a difference. And so you would output the number of people with flu and noise with standard deviation one, right? And you know, this is true, even if, if a single child uh, was not in the daycare, uh, you know, that's, that's a difference it would make. And you know, couple worlds privacy would also do something like that, okay? Uh, however, uh, now it depends on what we really want to achieve. So if we want the adversity, not to infer disease status of a certain person in a connected component, then this would even not be enough. Okay? Uh, and you know, again, you could look at group differential privacy. Group differential privacy would output the number of people with flu and it would add noise with standard deviation, which is, uh, let's say if you assume disjoint groups, then with maximum of the group size. Uh, but this may be too much noise, right? So if flu spreads with, uh, a lower probability, then you know maybe it would have been enough to. So let's say it's spread with probability 0.1. Maybe it would have been enough to add less noise than you know, what group differential privacy would do, which was add worst case. Okay. So what we are going to look at is we are going to look at a general, uh, a different uh, method, uh, a, a different privacy definition which is called buffer fish privacy, which is a generalization of differential privacy. Uh, it's one of the generalizations of differential privacy that can take correlation into account. Okay. Yeah. So in the flu example, you just had, um, so you don't want to add noise proportional to the kind of maximum. Exactly, it's, exactly. It's too much noise, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Like, yeah. Like, I, I, mean, I guess if, it, if there's just one group, you know, you're just giving me disease statistics for this one particular school, mm -hmm. and you don't add noise proportional to, I mean, and you don't sort of basically erase the signal completely, then in that slow probability event that the flu... Yeah, so in the low probability, probably, right, right, then, like, right. I, I'm a little confused about, like, what the... For that, like for that particular example, can you give us a sense of like what what you would consider kind of okay? So in this case, what would happen is uh, uh, you would have a set of model classes. So your model class could be that flu spreads with probability, let's say, 0.1 to 0.5, right? And under, let's say, if you take uh, here, 0.5 is the worst case model. So under that model, you are kind of uh, mm -hmm. adding enough noise to cover that model with high probability. So you are right. This is possible that there are like really low probability, you know, low probability cases where it would cover uh, uh, things. But uh, so I guess what what is the signal you're trying to get out? So you do do you want to know like? When everybody in the group is sick, you want that to be obvious, but when just a like a small number of people in the group are sick and the diffusion is not too broad. Yes, yes. So we are looking at so we are looking at cases uh, where uh, there's a lot of people may be correlated, mm -hmm. but the uh, the amount of degree of correlation is low. Mm -hmm. So actually, this one is probably the more appropriate example, right? So everything is correlated, but the individual amount of correlation is low. 
That's the kind of thing that we are trying to capture. Makes sense, sir. When you say individually, we're not interested. Yeah, so each, you know, each XT is correlated with the next, you know, with every other XTs, right? They're all correlated, but the individual amount is... Uh, well, I just don't know, I'm trying to understand what you mean by individual. Because if I thought about, let's suppose I take like a two-state Markov chain, right. which is really lazy. Right. And so it yeah. stays in the same state for a long time, and it's very correlated, actually, across short periods. Right, so then you would need to add a lot of noise for those kinds of cases. So but if you have a relatively fast-moving Markov chain, fast-mixing Markov chain, then you wouldn't need to, because... But then, okay. But if I had a very lazy chain, then I could rewrite the state vector as sleeping, eight hours, awake, 20 hours. Right, but that would be a different uh, representation. So that, that would be a different model. Right, and then, but then I would be able to, okay. Yeah. yeah, that would be a different privacy model also, right? Because here the statistical model is built into privacy. Yes. So, so essentially, you're going to use this feature that you just add noise to handle the correlation between successive steps here, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll come to this in a little bit. But we'll, we'll, we'll come to this in a little bit, yes. Uh, so, but the idea is that between successive states, there's a lot of correlation, but it's not like the, you know, all T things are highly correlated. I mean, if all T things are very, very highly correlated, there's nothing much you can do. Mm, so the kind of case we are trying to capture is a lot of things are correlated, but the uh, in some sense, some sort of average, I'm not defining average, of co correlation is kind of low. So that's, uh, that's the thing we are trying to capture. So this covers a fair number of realistic scenarios. I mean, there are other scenarios too, but it covers some realistic cases. Okay. Okay. So let's look at uh, what is buffer fish. So buffer fish is, you know, it's, it's a very general definition and, you know, it's, it's kind of abstract. So let me, you know, try to be a little bit concrete when I define it. Right? So, buffer fish consists of three components. So, one is the set of secrets S, and these are uh, this is essentially the information to be protected. So, for example, could be uh, a secret could be Alice's age is 25, Bob has a particular disease, things like that. Right? Uh, and then there are um, secret pairs, which are uh, basically pairs of secrets that you want to be that you don't want the adversary to be able to distinguish. Right? So, an example would be example of this pair would be something like Alice's age is 25, Alice's age is 40, right? You don't want the adversary to tell between these pairs, right? Or Bob is in the data set, Bob is not in the data set, okay? So, so far so good, but the, the power of uh, pufferfish to model correlation comes from uh, a third component that it has, which is a distribution class theta, right? And theta is essentially, it's a set of distributions that can plausibly generate your data. Right? So, for example, um, one uh, distribution class would be if you have that uh, underlying interaction network and you say that, okay, this is my interaction network and disease passes on with probability between 0.1 and 0.9. That would be a possible uh, you know, distribution class. Another distribution class could be, let's say you have this Markov chain and you know, it's, uh, here is the transition matrix. Right? So that could be another uh, possible uh, transition matrix, which you know parameters lie within some certain range. Yes. So when you say plausible, uh, what do you mean? Yes. So when I say plausible, what I mean is these are the kinds of generative uh, information that we are looking at. Right? So, the, so these are some distributions that could have generated the data. Now you have a set of distributions, so you can be conservative. You can say that, okay, so these are my set of distributions. I'm being really conservative here. Uh, but if you make your distribution class larger, usually you have to add more noise. So this is like a modeling assumption in some sense. Um, a very basic uh, confusion. So what kind of objects are you asking you? Like, uh, so the distribution class and distributions generate right. points in the data set. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Entries. And S and Q are subsets. Uh, S and Q are the things that you want to be indistinguishable. So, for example, events, events in these yeah, events. So, for example, the activity at time t is running. Events. That would be in the uh, space generator. Uh, yeah. The probability space corresponding to yeah. a particular theta. So, for example, in that uh, you know activity example, S would be you know activity at time t is running, time t is walking, time t is sleeping, right? The Q would be activity at time t is running versus activity at time t is sleeping. That would be, uh, okay. And uh, this is the distribution. Uh, theta is what will model correlation. Okay. 
And now here is the definition. So an algorithm is said to be epsilon puffer fish private with parameters <laughs> SQ and theta. If for all pairs of secrets, SI and SJ in uh, Q, for all theta in this distribution class, uh, and being x according, drawn according to theta and all t, uh, what you have is that this ratio is at most e to the epsilon, right? So what is this ratio? This ratio is the likelihood that a of x is t conditioned on s i and theta over the likelihood that a of x is t conditioned on s j and theta, right? So the difference is, you know, the difference between these two likelihoods is that the secret changed. Right? So SI versus SJ, these are two things that you want the adversary to not be able to distinguish. Okay? And uh, then uh, the, the other difference that I want to point out, which is different from differential privacy, is that in differential privacy, this kind of a likelihood would have been with respect to uh, just the randomness in the algorithm. Right? Here, it's with respect to both the randomness in the algorithm and this distribution factor. Right, so that is the so those are that that that's one of the differences. Okay, and uh, and you know and then obviously you want this to happen whenever probability the prior probability S i conditioned on theta and S j conditioned on theta these two prior probabilities are strictly greater than zero. Right, because otherwise you know, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Yes. Uh -huh. If I wanted to recover this regular differential privacy. So. Yeah. So I, I'm just okay. coming to that. Thing. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes. Sorry, but I, I'm trying to understand where is the correlation here? I mean, correlation is modeled by theta. Theta describes the correlation. So it is modeled by theta. Yes. yes. That describes the correlation. Yes, question. Okay, so, so big theta is the family of all possible distributions for the correlated data. Right. And you're yeah. considering like basically the worst case overall. Exactly. Worst case over all theta. Right, that's correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's like a worst average case kind of thing. Uh, and what does this mean? Well, uh, this is an interpretation that the, uh, the paper that introduced Pufferfish, the Kiefer, and Machan Jala paper uh, provide. This is essentially what this is saying is this is the prior odds of the secret, uh, probability SI given theta versus SJ given theta. These are the prior odds of the secret. If you look at the posterior odds of the secret after you have seen the output of the algorithm, then the posterior odds are not that much different from the prior odds. Right, so this is the, you know, I haven't proved this, this is an interpretation that they offer in their paper, okay? Uh, so this is the interpretation and it turns out, this is where I come to Anand's question, uh, epsilon differential privacy, this is again the thing that they show in their paper, it's not my result, is equivalent to epsilon puffer fish privacy with parameters S, Q and theta where uh, the secrets are of a certain, the pairs of secrets are of a certain form. Uh, and the form is, you know, if you look at individual i's in the data with value a versus i's in the data with value b for all i and a b pairs in the domain, uh, and also i's in the data with value a versus j's in the data for all i not equal to j and a, right? So essentially, you are trying to look at, uh, you know, what is the individual's value? Uh, is it a versus b for all pairs a and b, and whether this individual is in the data or that? or some other individual is in the data. So this is your set Q, uh, set of secret pairs. And the set of uh, set theta is all distributions where each individual is distributed independently. Right? Yes. So, uh, oh, was there a uh, adjacency requirement on S? Like no. Q has the pairs Q. Q is the pairs. Uh, S is, you know, the statements. Yes. Uh, wait, so. Theta is a distribution on the whole data set, so like n individuals. Mm -hmm. like, That's uh, So why is it that you're saying just the individuals have to be independent? Why isn't it, since you, in regular differential privacy, you wanted to hold for all possible databases in the universe, why isn't it all atomic distributions on the universe? Like, like single Oh, I see, I see. Uh, uh, with probability one takes this uh, data set. Shouldn't it be all I, I think you could also do all atomic. I think it, yeah, I think that would also. But I mean, all distributions are independent also covers all atomic, right? Right. I think, it's, yeah. I think uh, oh, yes, yeah, so each one could be an independent. Yeah. Atomic, okay. uh, atomic distributions are independent, but that's not good enough here. So, um, you, what, what you're, this is sort of, Parker Fish has kind of looked, if you remember, I'm not sure if you remember in my talk at some point there was this kind of 
Bayesian thing where you say, well, okay, let's imagine you had a prior on the data sets. Yeah. How, what would this be? So, your prior so what this framework is trying to do is make the prior kind of an explicit part of it. And what, in, what the, in the context of this specific slide, what it says is that for differential privacy, when I, if the prior is a product distribution, then I learn nothing significant at all about any one individual in the data. So my sort of posterior on every individual's data is the same, but close to my prior individual's data. So that's the perspective they're trying to take. So they want to compare, they want to say under what conditions, for which distributions, is the posterior distribution on the secret very close to the prior distribution on the secret? Um, that's great. Yeah. The perspective I took in the talk was in the tutorial was a bit different, where I was sort of comparing two different posterior distributions. One, the post conclusions you draw if I'm in the data, and the, the other is the conclusions you draw if I, if I were not used, if my data were not yeah. used. That's great. So that's like a different, when, when product distributions, those, these notions essentially are the same. Mm -hmm. With the arbitrary distributions, they, these notions kind of look, end up looking very different. And that is actually the notion you use in couple words privacy. That's the other, right? That's correct? That's the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The previous slide the looked like you compared to the posterior slide. No, so if you go back, uh, if you go back one slide to where you had, so look at, it's looking at the prior distribution on the secret condition on the model. So here the model says, model's just the description of theta, the little theta is the description of yeah, the, like it's a, just the description of the adversary's prior. So it is, <laughs> like it's sort of redundant to get once you have theta as a subscript to be here, but it's there for explicitness. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. So that, that's not, the thing on the right is not a posterior distribution. It's okay. prior. Yeah, that's great. Okay. The one distribution that uh, reduces to okay. that, the, the one for the I mean, it is equivalent in, in the case uh, where you have one distribution. Yeah, so the, the generality of Pufferfish is aiming for a couple of things. So one is like the secret doesn't have to be individual people's data. It could be other things. Right. Uh, so I don't want to hide yeah. <laughs> No, I'm glad it's generating so much interest. Right? No. People really want to understand. Yeah, just stare at it one by one from this point one another second and just slow things. Okay. Uh, okay. No, no, no. Okay. Now, now, now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So like now I don't know what Wait, actually, I'm going to fill it. I'm going to give you another question. Could you go back to the definition for a moment? So, uh, yes. I'm, um, I'm struggling with this. So, theta is, is capturing the correlations among people. Mm -hmm, that's correct. But yes. not, let's say, among attributes. You could also use it in an attribute so, sense. So, if your secret says yes. secret has to do with not being able to distinguish whether a certain uh, location in the DNA is C or T. Right. Um, and it turns out that later on you find out that this other portion of the DNA is very, very closely correlated with right, what in right, question. Right, 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 right. Will theta capture that or not? Uh, you would you, have you to. You explicitly say as right. a secret, I do not want to this to reveal whether whether Kamalika has a C in this location, the major allele or the minor allele. Right, that's correct, yes. Um, but but you're, you're leaking other kinds of information. You are, exactly. And yeah. later on it turns out there's a strong correlation between the 25,000 SNP right, and the one right, in question. Right, right. So you wouldn't, so I, I agree with you, but then that would not be an application where you would use this kind of thing, right? So that would be an application where you would be conservative and you would use the fact that, you know, you would either use differential privacy or you would use the fact that, uh, you know, maybe there will be a hundred other locations that would be correlated. Right. And but, but you have a coral thing. Yeah, you have a for all theta, for all but this, you pick them in, the class, in that yeah. class theta, uh, in that class, okay. in that model class, right? So you have to pick the model class conservatively. Did I stall long enough, Sasha? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <it's like> collusion. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so it has to be the model class. <laughs> Uh, okay, so how do we get puffer fish privacy? So, you know, previously people have been, obviously people came up with this definition, people have looked at this, and it turns out that there are a bunch of special case mechanisms. So people have looked at, you know, what happens in this specific case, and they have designed mechanisms for it. And what we are going to do is, uh, and prior to our work, there was no completely general puffer fish mechanism, right? So there was nothing which would say, okay, 
give you a buffer fish framework and I will give you a mechanism that will give you privacy in this framework. And uh, that is uh, one of the things that we do, right? And, uh, and, you know, so the reason why we wanted to do this is, you know, we looked at puffer fish. So we said, well, what does the sensitivity mechanism look like, right? That's because that's the absolute basic mechanism in differential privacy. And, uh, you know, it wasn't that simple, but we came up with one. So that is our first result. Uh, so, you know, if you remember from this morning, the sensitivity method is, or this is the global sensitivity method. Uh, you find the worst case distance between uh, a function, you're trying to calculate the global sensitivity of a function, you find the worst case distance between f of d and f of d prime, where d and d prime differ in a single uh, individual's value, right? In our case, we don't have, I mean, we, we may want to calculate this function, but things are a little bit more complicated, right? Because now we have this likelihood, we have some, you know, once we are given theta and a secret, it's a distribution, right? Or f of x is, you know, you have a likelihood, you have a distribution. And then you have a slightly different distribution when you are looking at conditioning on a different secret, right? So what is the right measure? So we now we have to think about distances between distribution and, you know, what, what is the right metric? So it turns out that, you know, if you look at it and, you know, you kind of stare at it long enough, then it turns out that the right measure is something called the infinity Wasserstein distance, okay? So what is the infinity Wasserstein distance? Suppose you're given two measures, P and Q, and G of P of P and Q is the set of all joint distributions which have P and Q as marginals, right? So I think in the theoretical uh, CS community, people also call these couplings, right? So, or, you know, like in math also people call these couplings. So you look at all couplings between P and Q. Uh, and uh, then you look at uh, basically the following quantity, right? So this is the infinity versus in this sense. You look over each coupling, uh, you, you take the infimum over all couplings in the set, G, P, and Q. You look at each pair, X and Y, in the support of this coupling, and you look at the distance between these two, right? So, uh, X and Y are, you know, X is according, uh, distributed according to P, Y is distributed according to Q, right? So what is going on? So essentially, intuitively what's going on here is you have some distribution P and you have some distribution Q and what you're trying to do is you're trying to move probability mass from P to Q, right? So this is what P looks like. Uh, you want to move probability mass so that you, uh, you know, you transform P into Q, right? And the maximum amount that you would move any probability mass that is the Wasserstein distance, right? Uh, it is like Earth mover, but Earth mover is the L1 version of this. This is the infinity version. So D is some... D is some, you know, distance. Okay, so... Some metric. Well, here actually we are looking at uh, single dimensional functions. So here it's just the, yeah. So here is just the distance between, you know, X, absolute value of X minus Y. Is it all finite? Uh, I mean, they are not uh, They don't need to be discrete, but uh, these are like single, uh, single dimension. Okay. So here, for example, what would happen is, you know, if you're trying to move some mass from P to Q, is uh, you know, you would move this, right? You didn't move anything, uh, and then you take a bit of one and move it to zero over there, right? And then you take the rest of one, and then you have a little bit of mass at K, and the only thing you can do is move it to one. Right? And it turns out that in this case, the infinity Wasserstein distance is k minus 1 because you moved a little bit of mass from k to 1, but still the maximum amount of probability mass that moved was, uh, you know, was essentially uh, was k minus 1. Right? So this is the infinity Wasserstein distance. Uh, and, you know, uh, as I pointed out, this is very related to the earth mover and in fact earth mover is the L1 version of this. So, and uh, here we want the infinity version. Okay? So what does the Wasserstein mechanism do? So you have some puffer fish framework and you have a function. What you do is, again, this is not a computationally efficient mechanism, but what you would do is you would look at each secret pair, SI, SJ, in your pairs of classes, you know, sets of pairs of secret, and you look at each theta, right? Uh, for each of them, we, you define this, uh, um, define this distribution, mu of i theta. This is the distribution of f of x conditioned on SI and theta. Then you look at mu of j theta, where uh, mu of j theta is a distribution of x conditioned on x, j, and theta, right? And obviously, you only need to care about those si's and thetas such that, you know, this probability is greater than zero, okay? You look at, you calculate the infinity Wasserstein distance between each such pair and look at the maximum that you get, right? And that is your w star. And then 
you add noise with, uh, you know, you add Laplace noise with this parameter W star over epsilon, right? And it turns out that if you look at what happens with differential privacy, this will reduce to the global sensitivity mechanism. So this is a generalization of the global sensitivity mechanism in the buffer fish case. Okay, so uh, again, we can show that this is private, you know, it takes a bit of math, but you can uh, finally show it. Uh, and, you know, obviously reduces to the global sensitivity mechanism. Uh, the problem is obviously computational efficiency, right? So, because uh, you know, there's a lot of things to uh, calculate buses in distances over, and you know, even buses in distances are not that easy to calculate, right? And so, the question is is there something more computationally efficient? Okay? Uh, Can you have two distributions of Say you have two discrete distributions of cards. You can do that. You, you can do that, but there's a lot. I mean, here the difficulty comes from the fact that there's a lot of distributions, and you know you have to have some structure over them. Otherwise, you can't do it. Sure, sure, sure. Just want to make sure. Sorry. Exactly. Sorry, sorry. Where is the Wasserstein distance coming in into the into the definition? I didn't get that part. Oh, it's it's not in the definition. So if you no, plug no, so it, so you said it's a mechanism. Yes, it's a Wasserstein mechanism, right? So if you use this mechanism, this will satisfy the definition. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, here, if you use this mechanism, this will satisfy epsilon buffer fish according to the framework SQ theta. Oh, I see. So you do it for all, exactly. all the distribution pairs in your set. Exactly, pair. exactly, exactly. And the contribution is, you know, before this, if you had a buffer fish framework, you didn't know wh what would you do, right? And, you know, this is the problem we came up with. We didn't know what to do. And, you know, at least in theory, you have something that you could do. So somehow differential privacy, this problem uh, reduces to just looking at like the atomic distribution of something that is... Uh, yeah, 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 that's good, that's good. Yes. Uh, Adam? Uh, that was going to be my point. I see. My point. So like, just, if I understood correctly, the differential privacy, you don't, you don't need to do this because somehow the, the worst case or the atomic distribution is everything is determined. The F is then a deterministic thing. And absolutely, absolutely. No that's yeah, that's that's great. That's great. So here again, you're just assuming any reason to use the plus versus something else. Sorry? I mean, why are you adding the plus ones? Well, you could add, you know, like uh, what's uh, yeah, you you can add staircase noise also, right? Uh, but you know, this is simple. It's the analog of the global sensitivity uh, mechanism. Okay, so now what we do is we look at a slightly special case. Okay, so what we will do is we will uh, we want to do something that is now efficient, and you know we must limit the class of distribution. So we can't really do it in general, but what we do is we show some special case that will cover our physical activity measurement example, and we show an efficient algorithm for that. Okay, so what we will do is now we will use a special case of models, and to measure correlation, what we will do is we will use something called Bayesian network. Right, so a lot of you guys have, uh, you know, seen Bayesian networks that like heavily used in machine learning. They're also called graphical models. Uh, here, what happens is you have a graph. It's a directed acyclic graph. Each node is a variable, and the join distribution over the uh, over the variables is this product, right? So if you have x, the join distribution of x1 to over x1 to xn is the product over all i, probability of xi conditioned on the parents of xi. Okay, so this is the definition, uh, and you know this describes the joint distribution. Okay, so the joint distribution can't be arbitrarily complicated; it has to follow some rules. Okay, and here is the main idea that we are going to uh, uh, use. So suppose what we want to do is we have a node in this Bayesian network. Let's call it X one. What we want to do is we want to protect X one. Okay, our main idea is if you look at the nodes that are really far off from X one, these are almost independent of X one, right? The correlation has decayed quite a bit. Okay, so and then there are those nodes which are close to x1, right? So there is a local nodes and then there is a remote nodes. And what we are going to do is we are going to add noise to hide the local nodes, right? Hide the private values of the local nodes, and then we'll add a small correction to account for the remote nodes, which are almost independent anyway. Okay. Now the qu question is, you know, how uh, how do we define local versus remote, and you know, how do we find the correction? 
Yes, question. So your objective here to, to, to protect X1 only? Or you uh, if you do it over on X1, that will give you, uh, you can protect everything, right? So okay. this is the kind of the main central idea of that. Okay. Okay, so uh, I, I kind of said almost independent in quotes, right? The far away nodes are almost independent, right? So what is the notion of independence that is useful here? And it turns out that, uh, you know, a certain notion is useful and we call it the max inference. Now, it's possible that in information theory there's a name for this, but I don't know if some of the information theory people here can recognize this thing. Uh, so here is the notion that we use, okay? So the max inference of xi on a set of nodes xr is, we, def we define it as follows. Uh, this is um, the maximum, uh, so you maximum over all values little xr that uh, the set of nodes xr can take, okay, so probably, uh, and over all pairs a and b that xi can take, right. This is the probability that xr takes this value little xr, condition on xi equal to a and theta over the probability that xr takes this value little xr condition on xi equal to b and theta and the log of that, okay. So this is uh, this thing. Uh, um, so if this, uh, if you know, you can see that if xi and xr are independent, then this is going to be zero, right? Then these prob two probabilities are the same, and you take the log of one, that's zero, right? Uh, but the idea is that if this quantity is low, that means xr is almost independent of xi, right? It's not exactly, but it's close to being independent. Okay, and it turns out that uh, you know approximately if you want to protect xi and if you want to do the privacy calculations kind of the correction term that you need in the privacy calculation is e to the this max inference okay so the e to the uh, this max inference of xr condition uh, given xi okay so this is uh, you know so this is almost independent how do you find these large almost independent sets right so you could do a brute force search of the network, but that would be, you know, expensive. And now what we are going to do is we are going to provide a way of using some structural properties of the network. And, you know, in some special cases, these are going to be uh, polynomial time. Okay. So what structural properties? So it turns out that when you work with uh, graphical models of Bayesian networks, a very common concept that you often use is the concept of a Markov blanket, right? So what is a Markov blanket? If you look at a node, its Markov blanket is essentially its parents, its children, and um, and the children of its parents. So essentially, these are the set of nodes X S such that X I such that if you condition on X S, then X I is independent of the rest of the graph, right? So the, this part of the graph is independent on X I once you know X S, right? So in some sense, this is like the boundary, uh, you know. Yes. Do you, do you need the symbol? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't think. Yeah, this this is this is just bad picture drawing. You don't need the sibling, but I think you need the. Uh, I think you might need the parents. No, you don't need the parents of the other children. You don't need the sibling. So this is just bad drawing. I think. So, so you, you just need the three neighbors. Yeah. Exactly. You just need the neighbors. Okay. Uh, so, so it's the parent, the immediate children. Then, you know, the children and, and what was the other thing? I think it's either. You need to play baseball to figure out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's either the children of its other children of its parents or uh, parents of its. Or the children of the parents. Yes. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Either the siblings or the like the other parents of the children. You might need those also to condition. Yeah, yeah, this is someone not included in this picture. Well, I mean, by that definition, it's fine. You don't show any other parents, so it's hard to do. <laughs> That's true. Okay. So, uh, anyway, but the point is that, you know, this is like a set of nodes around this node such that the rest of, uh, is, uh, it's independent of the rest of the graph condition on this graph set. Okay. <laughs> so, now what we will do is we will need, uh, we won't really use the Markov blanket, but we'll need a concept or something that's a bit more general. So, we are going to call it the Markov quilt. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And the Markov quilt is defined as follows. Uh, XQ is a Markov quilt if deleting XQ, so let's say XQ is a set of nodes. So here this XQ is this kind of ring, right? 
So if you delete xq, that breaks up the graph into xn and xr. So think about n as the local part, kind of the inside, right? xq is, uh, you know, kind of the boundary, and xr is the outside, right? So xi lies in xn, right? And the rest, which is xr, is independent of xi, conditioned on xq, okay? So xr is independent of xi, conditioned on xq, uh, but the, the difference between Markov blanket is that there is also some extra nodes, right? So these xn's are some extra nodes uh, that you're not making the statement about, right? So the Markov blanket would be like a really tight Markov curve, right? There would be nothing else in the inside, uh, in, the, in the inside set, okay? That, that's just the difference, okay? And it turns out uh, we can... Uh, Define the score of a Markov quilt as follows. So it turns out that you can define the score of xq as the cardinality of xn. So xn is the interior set over epsilon minus this max influence, right? This max influence of uh, xq over x, uh, given xi. Okay. So on this the privacy, yes, the privacy parameter. Okay. And here, what happens is, you know, basically this term corresponds to this correction. Remember, I told you that we'll do a correction, right? Uh, because of xq and you know once you correct for xq you are done because xr is independent uh, so this is basically the correction due to xq and xr and this is the standard deviation of the noise that you need to add due to xn okay um, and it turns out that we can show this as a theorem that you know if you have a markov quid like this and if you add this much noise then it's sufficient to add that much noise uh, you know this much noise uh, if you want to protect xn Okay, so if all you care about is protecting xi, you have this Markov curve, you add this much noise, and this is sufficient. Okay? And so this leads to the Markov quilt mechanism. For each xi, find a Markov quilt with minimum score. And then you know you look at all the maximum overall i's, max of xi, uh, si, and then you know you add uh, Laplace noise. Okay? And we can show again that this will preserve uh, epsilon of fish privacy. Okay? And uh, the advantage is that unlike the Wasserstein mechanism, it's going to be polynomial time in special cases. Okay. So let me, in the five minutes that I have, let me give you a quick example, which was, you know, this uh, going back to that activity monitoring example that we talked about earlier in this in, in this talk. Uh, in this case, it turns out that if you look at the minimal mark of quilts, uh, they have a particularly nice form. So you have a chain, you know, this is your uh, xi. And the Markov quills would be something before and something after, right? So these are the minimal Markov quills. That's what they look like, right? And what you can do is uh, this: if you look at that Markov quilt, so this the brain nodes are, uh, are essentially uh, xq. That's the Markov quilt. This is your local nodes, and these are your outside nodes, right? And you can easily search over. Oops. You can easily search over these Markov quills. You know, if you look at an x. Uh, if you look at a particular xi, you can look at, you know, things, uh, you know, you can search over a's before and b's after, right? So you can search over these things, okay? Um, and it turns out that, uh, you know, how do you calculate these uh, uh, scores? Well, it turns out that um, under some conditions, uh, the problem really simplifies quite a lot. So if p theta are the state, uh, are the transition matrices, then under some uh, pretty standard assumptions, so the assumptions are, um, one of the assumptions is that the, uh, there is a, uh, it, it does converge to a stationary distribution. And that's, you know, like a relatively, I think that's a relatively reasonable assumption because if it doesn't converge to a stationary distribution, you can't really get privacy, right? You can't really expect the effect of any starting point to be lost. So, so you know, the, like a periodicity and things like that, that is, uh, I think that's, that's fine. Uh, and then the other one we need right now is reversibility. We are trying to work with some mathematicians to try to fix it. And I think it's probably there's something we can say. Uh, and so it turns out that under this assumption, uh, the, there are just two relevant parameters. So one parameter is pi theta, which is the minimum probability of any state under the stationary distribution under any theta. And then the second assumption, uh, the second parameter is g sub theta which is essentially the minimum eigengap of any of the transition matrices. So these are the two parameters you get. So you know the reason why I'm saying this to you is just to make the point that it becomes quite clean. And it turns out that you can calculate an upper bound on this uh, max influence, and the upper bound kind of looks like this. 
right? So it's a, you know, you can just calculate it, and then you can calculate the score. By the, so what are A and B? So A and B is if you have a Markov coil x i minus a and x i plus b, this would uh, be the. Not the same A B that you had in the definition of your E function. No, 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 no. Okay. sorry. Yeah. There are A and B from the previous slide. Yes, yes, right? yes. So yeah, that's that's your correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So if the chain is slow mixing. If the chain is slow mixing, then. Kind of build some nutrition, right? so the yeah. G theta is. If the chain is slow mixing, it converges? Uh, if the chain is slow mixing, then uh, you expect this max inference to go down slowly. Right? So this, uh, then it will go down slowly, it will be relatively large. Whereas if it's fast mixing, then you know, this max inference, uh, if it's independent, let's say the max inference is zero. Right? So uh, that's the correction. And so, you know, then this is your algorithm and you know if you run it brute force then it can be uh, this OT cube but you can you know do some optimizations and you can bring it down to T square okay so just in time here is the uh, conclusion <laughs> we looked at the privacy of correlated data so things like you know time series social networks and you know again this is you know very early so uh, we looked at two new mechanisms one was a fully general mechanism, so we know if there's something to do. And you know, we also looked at a more efficient mechanism, which was for a special case. And in future work, we have been looking at a bunch of different things. Uh, so one is composition, and it turns out that you know, in these cases, like the you know, the, like the uh, graphical models, there are some interesting things we can say about composition. And especially for the Markov quill mechanisms, you can say things about interesting things uh, that my student is working on. Um, and then the other uh, question is general mechanisms for other frameworks like couple worlds and things like that, which uh, actually Raif is looking at. So, um, and finally, let me end with, uh, so these are the two students who did all the work. And this is my colleague who, uh, you know, he works in sensor networks and he is the person who kind of introduced me to the uh, physical activity monitoring problem. He, you know, came to me and said, oh, I have all this data. Can you say something about this? Um, and with that, I will end it. Up. <laughs>